Today on Ryersonian TV, we'll break down the Ryerson Students' Union controversy and give you the latest updates. Next, we'll learn why campus construction raises concerns for those with mobility issues. And finally, we'll discover some fascinating secrets about Ryerson. Hello Ryerson, my name is Amanda Pope and welcome to Ryersonian TV. Today's top story, the university requested the Ryerson Students' Union undertake a forensic audit last year. This after allegations of financial mismanagement by former executives. The RSU instead asked PricewaterhouseCoopers to review credit card expenses. Ryersonian reporter Sharina Harris is here in studio to fill us in with all the details from the semi-annual general meeting on Monday night. Thank you so much, Sharina, for joining us in studio. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start off right now with this financial review? So my understanding is that the university asked the RSU to do the forensic audit last year. Why exactly did they ask them to do this? Yeah, so last year, the eye opener, one of the campus newspapers here at Ryerson, broke a story that basically accused a few different people within the RSU of spending thousands of dollars on RSU corporate credit cards. And even though the university always stresses that they're a separate corporate entity from the students' union, um, there were enough students who were really upset and demanding answers that they decided to step in. And so the university had three different things that they asked of the RSU. The first was that a forensic audit be conducted mm -hmm. um, and that the results be shared with the university. And the third thing was that the RSU needed to renegotiate their operating agreement with the university, okay. uh, which governs the fees. So students pay fees to the RSU every year and the university collects those fees and then gives them in different transfer installments throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So those were the three different conditions that the university imposed on the union. Okay, so then the university asks the RSU to do this forensic audit, but mm -hmm. the RSU decides to do something different. Yes. And they ask PricewaterhouseCoopers to do the review of their mm -hmm. credit card expenses. What exactly did the financial review find? Yeah, so um, I guess I should say also the reason that the RSU said that um, in their financial review, the reason they say that they didn't do a forensic audit is that they said it would be too expensive and take okay. too long. They said students demanded answers and they wanted to get something out sooner rather than later. So basically they had PwC do that review. They also had their own audit committee that further reviewed PwC's findings. So they found that on three different RSU corporate credit cards, a total of $260,000 was spent. Mm. They categorized that into four different categories based on whether or not there were proper receipts and documentation for all of those credit card expenses. Obviously, there are a lot of things that the RSU needs to buy for students. So it was kind of trying to figure out what is maybe a legitimate expense and what mm -hmm. isn't. What they ended up finding is that there was a category with $127,000 um, where they didn't have any proper documentation. And then out of that category, they found that there was just over $9,000 sorry, $99,000 mm -hmm. uh, more uh, that they couldn't verify the legitimacy of. And so right now it looks like that's the, that's the money that they have a lot of questions about. Mm -hmm. They're going to continue to review the expenses, but that's the latest update from them. Mm -hmm. And then all of this financial review information was revealed to students at the semi-annual general meeting, which was on Monday night. Mm -hmm. How did students react when they heard about all these numbers and the review information? Yeah, well, speaking for myself, I was surprised that it was not a forensic audit because that's been the language that has been used um, right up until about a week or two before the RSU kind of started changing mm -hmm. some of that language, calling it a financial review, calling it a credit card analysis. And there's actually a note in the review that says this is not an audit. Mm. Um, some students and board of directors members at the meeting raised concerns. They said Ryerson wanted an audit. Obviously now, as we know, Ryerson has terminated their agreement with the RSU. And they said they hadn't received an audit. We're not sure if they've yet received a copy of the financial review. Um, so students at the meeting and also online seem kind of upset that they didn't get the audit that they were promised. And they also seem really surprised at some of the expenses that were listed there. Mm -hmm. So at this general meeting, students were able to voice their concerns and ask questions. Right now we have a clip and here's one of the students' questions. People told me this doesn't officially count as a forensic audit because, and you outlined the price reasons and stuff. So was there any attempt to ask the university, since that was like one of their demands that they needed a forensic audit done, 
was the university asked like, oh, will you help us pay to get this forensic audit done? Or can you release some of our funds to get this forensic audit done? Because obviously I think I understand if you didn't have money, you couldn't afford it. But also if that was one of the university's very clear demands, what attempts were made to make sure we did provide a forensic audit? So we know in the video that it was just the student's question, but the RSU said they couldn't answer any questions about the financial review just because of legal reasons, but they did say that students could email their questions. So my question for you, Sharina, is what are the next steps for both the university and the RSU? Yeah, so last week the RSU announced that they're taking legal action against the university, saying that they couldn't legally terminate the agreement. Uh, the RSU is going to move forward with their winter elections as planned and um, kind of try to have business as normal, obviously, with a lot of different service disruptions. Mm -hmm. um, and the university is also moving forward with elections of a different kind. So they've promised students that they're going to help facilitate a process to create a new student union um, and a new student government. So they currently have a committee of students that are going to work on creating an election for a new student government structure. That election is going to take place in March. And then whoever wins that has to commit to holding general elections in April for a new student Union at Ryerson. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sharina, for coming in studio today to give us all this information. I know it can be very complicated to understand, but having you here answer these questions has really cleared some stuff up. So thank thanks. you. Thanks, Amanda. So it's been just over a year since the RSU scandal began. You may be wondering, how did we get here? Ryersonian reporter Dea Kodra has all the details that brings us to where we are today. You might have seen that the Ryerson Students' Union has been in the news a lot recently. What happened? On January 28, 2020, the Ryerson Students' Union president, Vanessa Henry, announced that the union had taken legal action against Ryerson University. This came days after the university announced it was immediately terminating its agreement with the RSU and would no longer recognize it as Ryerson's official student government. The claim the RSU filed asks that the Ryerson University recognize the union as an elective student representative and return their funds. When students pay their tuition, the university collects the money on behalf of the RSU. The problem with that is that the university has withheld these funds since January 2019. The money is supposed to be given to the RSU for their programming and their student groups. Now here's the catch. The RSU is claiming that the university cannot legally do that. If you don't remember, back in January 2019, the eye-opener reported that credit card statements under the names of RSU President Ram Ganesh and Vice President Operations Severine Gasol showed purchases totaling thousands of dollars for food, alcohol, clothing, and entertainment. To better understand all of this, let's go further back in time. In May of 2018, the RSU fired their general manager. The general manager is responsible for overseeing the union's finances. But why? Well, their goal was to split the responsibilities of the GM into two new jobs, but they never actually hired someone to handle their finances. Instead, they gave one credit card to the president and another one to vice president operations. The intention of the credit card was to cover expenses from RSU events and other union activities. This violated the RSU's own financial policies, it says only the GM and financial controller can have credit cards. Now all of a sudden, purchases started racking up. But here's the catch. Some of those purchases did not appear to be RSU related. At a board meeting on February 1st of last year, the financial controller said the total amount spent on those cards was $273,000. Yep, $273,000. Jumping to February 11th, 2019, the board voted to impeach Ganesh. They also voted to suspend Gasol. Remember that these were the two people who held on to those credit cards. The RSU then elected McLean de Weber to be their new president. Ryerson told the RSU it had to complete a forensic audit. But what is a forensic audit? Well, it's a process that involves examining a company's financial records. A forensic audit could be used to gather evidence for a court case. But on February 3rd, the union announced that because of cost and time, they instead had PricewaterhouseCoopers do a review of the RSU's credit card expenses. Following this financial review, RSU's audit committee found $99,477 in expenses that they couldn't verify the legitimacy of. 
But why should you care about the RSU finances? In the 2018-2019 fiscal year, students paid $78 to the RSU. There's over 32,000 full-time undergrads at Ryerson. That means the RSU gets over $2.5 million per year from students. Now, this amount has changed in September 2019, as students were able to opt out of the RSU fees as per the Student Choice Initiative. This money is supposed to go towards things like administrative staff and expenses, as well as campus groups. But since February of 2019, the RSU and the university have been trying to come to an agreement. But no luck. On January 30th, the RSU held a blackout demonstration to show what the campus would look like if a student's union didn't exist. During the blackout demonstration, some equity services were shut down. This meant that student services, like the Student Campus Center front desk and copyright, were closed. The Good Food Center was still open. So, what happens next? Well, on January 29th, the school announced that they were in the process of appointing an external chief process officer to help with creating a new student government. But, the RSU says they still plan to run an election. Voting is open from February 12th to the 14th. So get ready to hit the polls, Ryerson. For the Ryersonian, I'm Dea Kodra. Campus construction began in March 2019 and was originally planned to wrap up this past December, but it's still going on. Even though the construction is inconvenient for all students, it can be especially challenging for those with mobility issues. Here's co-broadcast executive producer Kelly Skirvin with the story. Construction on campus can be an inconvenience to students and community members, but for some students, it can raise mobility concerns. Charmaine Reed, co-lead with Rye Access, says that her office has heard a number of concerns from students about accessibility around construction. We do have one community member who uses a, a mobility device who reached out to us in concern with like the big snowfall that had happened last week. Um, and raise concerns about the, the snowfall, especially on the corner of um, Church and Gould, right there, where the engineering building gets out, because there is all the fencing and then the garbage can on one side, so it's impossible for a person with a chair to get, it's possible for a person with a chair to get through, but not if there is other people walking on the sidewalk. Reed said that she has reached out to Facilities Management Department, also known as FMD, on behalf of students to bring up accessibility concerns, but has only been linked back to the FMD's website. According to FMD, they did consult Access Ryerson, a group run through the university and separate from Rye Access, which is run through the Ryerson Students' Union. Heather Willis, Accessibility Coordinator with Access Ryerson, says that she could have reached out to Rye Access more. In an interview, Willis said that I think that FMD felt probably I can't speak for them specifically, but they did consult with me, and my role is Accessibility Coordinator, so they probably felt that they had reached out to the disability community. I think that I have a role to make sure that I'm communicating with Rye Access as well. Willis did add that there was a number of public consultations that Rye Access could have attended. Construction began in March 2019 and was originally planned to be completed by last December according to FMD. The deadline was set back once again to February 2020, but recent steam water leaks stalled progress, leaving a completion date up in the air according to the FMD. In an emailed statement, Ryerson's FMG said that the underground depth and scope of our infrastructure excavations required extraordinary coordination with the City of Toronto to protect existing city waterworks and other public utilities. According to the FMD, Gold Street will reopen to the public once paving stones are installed. Plants and new lights will also be installed by the spring, but it all depends on the weather. The alternate accessible route for students is to travel from the SLC building to RCC building, but Reed says this can also be troubling. So the RCC elevator went down, which is fundamental to the university's accessible route, which is to take the, the bridges through the SLC to Kerr Hall to the RCC as a means of crossing Gould. Yet if the elevators don't work in this instance, then it's... It's ineffective, um, especially when the starting point is the SLC, which we know that the ramp there is inaccessible um, and ineffective for students. The, the elevators in the SLC take a long time, and then if they were to get all the way to RCC, they would not be able to get out of that building if the 
um, elevators were not working. It is not only more time consuming, but it's not also a guarantee that you would be able to make it to class the same way that just going down Gold Street on the sidewalk would offer you. Although FMD did consult with Access Ryerson, Reed wishes Rye Access was involved in the consultation process. I would have loved to see a real meeting, like a collaborative space, for students to assert what they need from the Gould Street revitalization. Because if Gould Street wasn't serving students before, there's no guarantee it's going to serve students unless we ask them what they needed. For the Ryersonian, I'm Kelly Skirvin. Four new exhibitions are open at the Ryerson Image Center. I had the chance to speak with the curators of the exhibit Extending the Frame, 40 Years of Gallery TPW, created in part by Ryerson grad students. Here's the story. A new Ryerson Image Center exhibition shows how the Toronto Photographers Workshop has evolved and built a community for artists, especially Ryerson students and alumni. Extending the Frame, 40 Years of Gallery TPW, was organized by Ryerson grad students, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and Gallery TPW. A number of Ryerson professors' work are on display, including Vid Ingolovics, Nina Levitt, and alumni Edward Bertinsky. Chair of the Board of Directors at Gallery TPW, Elle Flanders, says the exhibit shows how much opportunity there is for Ryerson students in the arts industry. What I would hope is that it would be an inspiration um, for young photographers and young artists to see like, huh, you know, there's kind of this fantastic like evolution and continuity over time where I can actually like see myself where am I going to be in 30 years 20 years etc to see that you can actually exist in the world um, with what it is you're passionate about doing and I think that's what a lot of these photographers and artists are showing you is that they're still working. The exhibition highlights four decades of programs by this artist-run center, founded in 1977. It's divided into five chapters and has documentary photography, repurposed found imagery, installations, performances, and more. Of kind of a bunch of young photographers coming together um, just out of school and starting to feel their way through, you know, what we always call the real world after school. It's that hard reality of like, now what? We don't have dark rooms to work in anymore. We don't have a community necessarily. So they created a community. And I think that by creating TPW, what they were able to do was kind of almost recreate that sense of community that they had when they were in school. The Rick Exhibition's curator, Gael Morel, was also a part of the group who started TPW 40 years ago. She says this exhibition is relevant today because in order to move forward, the past must be considered. The importance of photography in the arts and in the culture field has changed tremendously. Um, the, you know, the idea of the medium being recognized by museums have kind of, you know, been achieved in a way. And so now the conversation is to shift. Uh, what kind of photography do we want to present? What, what do we want to say around it? Uh, how, you know, can we even uh, be better at it and go further? And, and so the idea to look at what has been done in the past in a very specific context and what we're doing today can help us understand what, where we want to go in the future. Extending the Frame 40 Years of Gallery TBW is one of four new exhibitions open from January 22nd until early spring at the RIC. For the Ryersonian, I'm Amanda Pope. Ryerson Athletics has been on fire this semester. Here's Ryersonian sports reporter Matthew Rodriguez with the top sports stories of the year so far. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, Ryerson, let's take a look at five of the top sports stories of 2020. The Ryerson Rams men's hockey team will wrap up their regular season the week of February 3rd. Goaltender Taylor Dupuy will finish his career, ranking second all-time in Ryerson Rams wins and saves. Over his five-year career at Ryerson, Dupuy totaled 42 wins and 1,922 saves. The men's basketball team broke Ryerson's record for most points scored in a game. On January 29th, the Rams scored 116 points in a win over the McMaster Marauders. Jaden Frederick and Tavon Coco led the way with 25 points each. They were supported by four other Rams who scored in double digits. Speaking of record breakers, Tenor Nagam became the holder of another Ryerson record, 
when he scored the most rebounds in a game by a Ram ever. Nagam posted 23 rebounds in a game against the Western Mustangs on January 11th. This beat the previous record of 21 rebounds by Joseph Imbrogno in 2006. The Rams went on to defeat the Mustangs by a score of 87-82. to Two Ryerson cricket players were honoured by being named the American College Cricket Players of the Year. Kartik Desai and John Paul Rock received the award for their strong seasons in 2019. The pair, alongside Ryerson's Cricket Club, is currently preparing for a major tournament in March. And finally, basketball legend Kobe Bryant died on January 26, alongside his 13-year-old daughter Gianna Bryant and seven others. Toronto paid their respects by organizing a silent vigil last week outside the Scotiabank Arena. Basketball fans showed up bearing jerseys, shoes, basketballs, and flowers to celebrate his life and career. Well, this has been your update on sports. I'm Matthew Rodrigo Pohl for the Ryersonian. Back to you, Amanda. Have you ever wondered what mysteries lurk at Ryerson? Ryersonian photographer Brent Smith joins Kelly Skirvin in studio to discuss his investigative series called Rye Files and the fascinating discoveries he has made. Kelly? Hey Ryerson, I'm Kelly Skirvin. Today joining me is Ryersonian reporter and photographer Brent Smith. Brent has been uncovering some surprising and fascinating facts about our university over the last few weeks. Uh, Brent is here today to talk to me about Rye Files, the docuseries that he's producing. Thank you, Brent, for joining us. Of course, always a pleasure. And so let's just get right into it. What will the Rye Files videos investigate? So uh, it's my fourth year at Ryerson. Over the last three and a half years, I've you know heard all these rumors and kind of weird intricacies about the happenings of Ryerson and why things are the way they are. And I decided that, you know, like launching a little true crime-ish series to kind of investigate would be something fun to do in my final semester. And how did this idea come to you? Uh, so I used to work for Ryerson Convocation, so I'd help out all the graduations, awards, dinners, things like that. And uh, when the convocations used to be held at the Ryerson Theatre, whenever the graduates would be walking in, the bells would chime at the clock tower in Kerr Hall. And uh, I always thought it was a really nice touch, like play some music, like an old school clock tower with the bells, until my boss told me that there was actually no bell in the clock tower. Oh. And that kind of piqued my interest and my curiosity, and I decided that, you know, there's a lot of things at Ryerson that I think people don't know about that would be fun to kind of learn about. And we know that you've only released the trailer so far, and without giving too much away, can you tell us what you have uncovered so far? Uh, well, I'm not going to spoil anything because, you know, some things turn out to be true and false, but mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you some of the rumors that maybe appear in the trailer that I've investigated. Some are true, some are false. So, like I mentioned, no bell in the clock tower in Kerr Hall. Um, some of the buildings, especially the RCC, has like the mint and the wood kind of like color scheme. Yeah. It's actually based on a church oh. in Toronto. Uh, the Egerton Ryerson statue once vanished for three weeks. Again, not saying if that's true or not, but that's, that was a rumor that I uh, investigated and found out the truth about. And um, last one being that Kerr Hall may or may not use, have used to held dead bodies. Okay, so I want to talk about that because, mm -hmm. um, what, excuse me. Yeah, so uh, Kerr Hall back in the day used to be uh, a mortuary and used to have dead bodies and they would experiment on them and kind of do whatever morticians do and it's maybe haunted ever since. And what has been the most mind-blowing fact that you've discovered so far? Uh, well, I don't want to spoil any of the truths. I want people to tune in and watch the docu-series. But uh, just a fun fact that I've learned that uh, Kerr Hall, the ratio of men's to women's bathrooms is three to one and it's been that way since it was built. And do you know why? Yeah, so uh, it used to be an engineering school. That's what it was designed for. and. Uh, back back then, that uh, women were not allowed in the engineering programs. They thought it was no point having women's bathrooms equal to men's bathrooms, and it's kind of stayed that way ever since. And you know what? I have noticed that, you know, taking classes in Kerr Hall, which I am now going to avoid, that I know that there were once dead bodies Maybe in there. Maybe there still is. I don't know. Thank you, Brent, so much for coming in today to tell us all about Rye Files. Of course. It was a blast. And for all the Rye Files videos coming soon, you can check out the Ryersonian.ca. But first, we have a little treat for you. We have a sneak peek of Rye Files. Check it out right now. What if I were to tell you it were all a lie? The things you never needed to think about. The unspoken truths. What if they were rumors? that some things at Ryerson had deep-rooted backstories, or perhaps are wrapped in complete lies. What if you were to learn the clock tower who sings from the quad 
echoing the bells inside, contained no bells. Without the Egerton Ryerson statue we walk by every day, once went missing for three weeks only to reappear where it had once stood. Or even that the colors inside some of the campus's buildings were influenced by religious organizations. Or that Kerr Hall once housed dead bodies. Would it all sound too crazy to be true? Who would investigate these rumors? Who would follow the breadcrumbs to find the loaf of bread known as the truth? Now, what if I were to tell you? We did. Well, that trailer looked pretty intense. That's what's happening in the news, Ryerson. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us next time. I'm Amanda Pope for Ryersonian TV.